Welcome to the, can you believe it, the eighth of the Provost Forum's events this year. Um, so the Provost Forum on the Public University and the Social Good. Our lecturer today is Daryl Smith, Senior Research Fellow and Professor Emerita of Education and Psychology at the Claremont Graduate University. We're delighted and privileged to welcome her to UC Davis today, to welcome such an eminent diversity scholar both to the campus and to this series. And I know that we're gonna learn a lot from her extensive experience and deep thought on this important subject. If Professor Smith didn't exist, I dare say our organizing committee would have had to invent her. <laughs> For the subject of diversity is deeply intertwined with the public service mission of land-grant universities such as the University of California. How can we truly serve the public in our state and beyond if we're ignoring or not paying sufficient attention to the entire demographic of our state? Our public service responsibility has a number of aspects, but chief among them is providing opportunity for education, for employment, and crucially, for success, regardless of one's background and heritage. How an institution goes about the difficult work of accomplishing this goal has been a primary focus of Professor Smith's career. I'll point to just one more reason that diversity is an inevitable topic whenever we discuss what we want universities to be and do. An inevitable topic, I might say, but not necessarily one free from controversy. Now, no, word, no university worthy of the name is content to provide teaching and research of undistinguished quality. The pursuit of excellence is always an implicit and usually an explicit part, uh, part of our mission. Now, there are people who have said and occasionally represent the position that diversity and excellence are different points on the scale and that there's a trade-off between them. Um, now, one of the most important things that we have learned and that has been well demonstrated that nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, diversity is an important component of excellence. Now, the fact that we know that, at least certainly I know that, doesn't mean that the controversy is over. It rears its head many times and we really need to be um, trained and think deeply about this complex of issues so that we can engage in debates and, um, and, and make sure that other people see the ways that diversity does contribute to excellence, is an essential component of excellence. So one of the things that I find so interesting, and it's a great opportunity today, is that um, as we'll discuss, and I'm sure that we'll learn from Professor Smith's talk, this question that I'm getting at is an intellectual question, one that we really want to engage in in a university. You know, I'm a, I'm a person of, of letters, I'm interested in words. I think one of the interesting things that we'll dig into and learn about is how exactly we define excellence. Indeed, what exactly do we mean by diversity? And how is it, how can we better formulate this thing that we now are convinced of that diversity does enhance excellence? And, and since the debate is ongoing, you know, and giving the devil his due, um, how do we understand some cases where it might seem not to be the case? We really need, as a university does, to be armed with all of the research, all of the arguments that can be made about it so that we can engage very responsibly and powerfully in that discourse and build that university which is diverse because it's excellent and excellent because it's diverse. Our featured lecture should be enough for any event, but as they say, there's more. We're also privileged that the following two distinguished individuals from our own campus will participate as panelists. Kevin Johnson, Dean of the School of Law, and maybe a Paulist Professor of Public Interest Law and Chicana, Chicano Studies, and Maureen Stapleton, uh, Maureen Stapleton, right. Maureen Stanton, I don't know where that came from. Um, yeah, yeah. Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Professor of Evolution and Ecology. Uh, before I 
watch more reruns, but no. Before I leave the subject of our program, let me remind you all that you're invited to continue the discussion during the reception in this location immediately following the question period. Very quick look ahead before, uh, ahead before I turn over the podium. Today's Provost Forum will be the penultimate one of this year's series. We've gotten one more, a very unusual one. On Monday, June 2nd, we finish our season with six of our undergraduates who will present their findings. Uh, this is part of their honors research project into the ideas that their students have, their fellow students have about the public university. So that's going to be very, very interesting. Um, I hope that all of you will be able to attend that and details um, are on my website. And if you can't make that, uh, that one eventually will be, in fact, all will appear in, as videos on that website. Website. Before I end, I want to again thank all of those who make these events possible. First, the Provost Forum's organizing committee for their ongoing efforts and expertise. Two campus entities that work to co sponsor these events the UC Davis School of Education, or this event in particular, UC Davis School of Education, and the Community and Regional Development Program. Our moderator, Professor Cristina Gonzalez of the School of Education and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Our panelists, Dean Johnson and Vice Provost Stanton. And our guest, Professor Smith, thank you so much for coming. And now Professor Gonzalez will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this presentation about diversity and excellence. Albert Einstein is supposed to have said that the big problems we are facing today cannot be solved at the same level of thinking that we had when those problems were created. And I will add that those problems cannot be solved with the same set of thinkers that we had when those problems were created. And this is why diversity is so important. Neither thinking as usual nor the usual thinkers will do. We have to interrupt the usual. We have to interrupt the usual. And this is precisely what Dr. Daryl Smith is going to talk about today. Uh, this is her expression, not mine. Okay. Um, she is very well known. She really doesn't need an introduction, but I will say a few things anyway. Um, she's Professor Emerita of Education and Psychology at Claremont Graduate University, where she has a post-retirement appointment as a senior research fellow. Um, her area of expertise is diversity, many aspects of diversity, like organizational implications of diversity, governance issues, issues uh, leadership issues. She has done a lot of work about faculty diversity, which is a topic that is so crucial for this campus right now. Um, she also has done a tremendous amount about diversity in science and engineering fields, which is also very important for us. Um, her list of publications is very long, and I'm not going to attempt to summarize this, but I will mention two titles that I personally found very useful when I was doing my own research and writing about leadership and diversity, and I have used these books a lot. Achieving Faculty Diversity, Debunking the Myths. This is from 1996. It was very well received at the time and uh, had a great impact. I have used that a lot. <laughs> and from 2009, Diversity's Promise for Higher Education, Making It Work. So just two titles that I have found helpful. She has many other publications. Uh, she also has done all kinds of other things. She has been an, uh, an advisor, an evaluator, a consultant for many organizations and programs. So she has really covered every aspect of diversity and it's wonderful that she has been able to come here today. After her lecture, we're going to have a panel, as the provost has indicated, with a couple of campus colleagues, and I want to say a few things about them too, Kevin Johnson and Maureen Stanton. Um, Maureen Stanton is our current vice provost for academic affairs. She's a professor of evolution and ecology, and her area of expertise is how animals and plants adapt to a changing environment, which is a very <laughs> important topic today. 
And, and Kevin Johnson is the dean of the law school, he's professor of public interest law and also Chicano Chicano studies. His field of expertise is uh, immigration law and civil rights issues and how they interact, also a very important topic. I want to say that both these Davis colleagues are very prolific and distinguished scholars, and that they both have shown a commitment to diversity issues from the start, not just now because they are administrators, but they have been doing these things for a long time. So this is really a wonderful group of scholars and academic leaders. And I'm really looking forward to their comments about ways to interrupt the usual and move the university and society to a new level of thinking with a larger and more diverse set of thinkers. And now, without more ado, let's welcome Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to stand here and wander. You can hear me. If at any point you can't, do this. Or if it's too loud, do that. But we've got this. One of the things I've learned in every room is a different setup. And since I'm not reading text, it's behind my back. I'm conscious of time because I want to leave time for not only the wonderful panelists you have here, but also for, for conversation about this topic. So there will be some things you'll see that I may not comment on. If you want to bring me back to it, that's fine. But I want to underscore what the provost said. This is about excellence and what it is to mean to be excellent in a pluralistic society. So I'm going to try to play with how we've traditionally talked about diversity and reframe it in a way that I think has important institutional implications. The first thing I want to say, because it's very important in understanding, you set me up beautifully today, thank you, is this question about what do we mean by this thing? And I'll show you things you'll resonate with. But the first thing I want to do is set a context for our diversity conversation. It is very important in this work to begin to understand that we have at least 50 years of unfinished business with respect to diversity in this country that traces its origins back to historically underrepresented communities, African American, Latino, Native communities, and in some fields, white women. Yes? So what you see in the, if any study of higher education would say we've made progress, and we have a tremendous amount of unfinished business. And it's that unfinished business that has to stay at the heart of what I'm going to follow up by saying, or we lose the, the notion about diversity. But at the same time, we cannot deny that there are increasing domains for diversity, and they are very important. So you'll see this list. And I don't have to go through that list for you to recognize issues of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity is one of the newest issues that campuses are dealing with. Ten years ago, we didn't talk about gender identity. For me, what you see in this list of disabilities, immigration, you know, we've gone through the second largest wave of immigration in the last number of years in this country. So immigration issues have now emerged as important parts of this diversity set of domains of identities in, in higher education. We see much more work on indigenous communities. And I, I have to challenge all of our California institutions, particularly the land grants, to say, well, how do we, well do we do in serving indigenous communities? Issues of their future, sovereignty, viability, et cetera, are very important. And of course, internationalization. You, you can't go anywhere without that. So we've got the, the traditional. We now are paying much more attention, are using the language of first generation students. Um, Another recent addition to our list to be concerned about is veteran status. Yeah, so we're paying attention to some of these veterans, many of whom come from underrepresented and underserved communities. The key here, and this is where, uh, thank you for talking about the core of this as an intellectual matter. This has to go to the core of identity. Traditionally, we have dealt with diversity as sort of single identities one at a time. What is very clear from the research, what's very clear from all the work, is the notion of an individual is about many identities and how they intersect. So for example, we used to be able to talk about student success by gender and by race. Well, if you're really doing good practice today, you're going to at least do race and gender. You'll probably do class to see who is being successful on your campuses. And that's, you know, we're, many of the campuses, certainly many of the UCs are concerned about men of color. So you see 
race and gender. So this is a fundamentally complex notion of identity. If we did a workshop here and I said, okay, list for me all your identities, you'd, typically people put 10 or 12. Because as individuals, we're complex beings, but our society is organized according to some pretty salient identities which manifest themselves here. And of course, we've got the changing demographics in every state, California and Texas being the leaders, of what it means to be in a majority minority state. This is, you will have seen this, white population, uh, 39%, Latino, 36%. This is a very diverse state. The University of California serves the people of California. This is a very diverse demographics. This is our world. Now, if you go to many campuses, you might think you're in that world at the undergraduate level. You're not in that world at the graduate level. You're really not in that world at the faculty level. And uh, uh, let's just be worried about our leaders who don't have that world surrounding them. So this is the world in which we live. Now, the implications for our society is really important for me to emphasize, because this has to go to the core of a public university and its mission. And this is just some of the things that have emerged from the research. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work on under what conditions diversity works. You see, we have traditionally framed diversity as to prove that it's good. Well, what I would say to you is diversity is. Now the question is, under what conditions does it work? How do we make it work? That pluralistic democracy that really works. Look around the world and see whether diversity just generically brings good. And I would suggest to you, the rest of the world doesn't look very pretty. But if we want a healthy society that works, we better figure it out. And that's where the core of this work comes. So the, fundamentally, the work on diversity now, when institutions do it well, will, depend, will dictate the health and well-being of our society, not just for diverse groups, but for everybody in the society. The health and well-being of our society which means if you're, if you're in the medical field, your top, one of your top priorities is erasing health disparities. That has economic consequences to have health disparities, access to health care, all of that. Educational disparities. You know there's a new book out on the social inequality. Well, one of the things political scientists have learned is that if you want to predict instability in a society, instability, does any of us want to live in an unstable society? Then just increase inequity. Well, one of the things that is very clear is education is a lever for reducing inequity in our society. So educational inequities that exist are not good for the health and well-being of our society. And of course, I'm very conscious that I'm at Davis. And this is a campus where you wouldn't spend much time before you understood that it was into sustainability. It's into the environment, yes? It, didn't, it took me longer to find diversity stuff than sustainability. Well, what's coming out now, and it didn't come out for a long time, is the quality of environment, and water, in poor communities, underserved communities. I live in Los Angeles. The re revelations about toxic and lead in poor communities. So if we're gonna be concerned about the environment, it's not just trees and generic water and Sierra Club. We're going to be concerned about, in many cases, the very communities that don't have access to voices in our society. So this question of who has access to healthy environments, healthy food, healthy water, is a key one. Dealing with the histories of violence and injustice, the world is full of stories of violence and injustice. The question is, how do you move forward from that? And whether you're in Ireland studying the Protestant Catholic issues, whether you're in South Africa trying to resolve their issues, whether you're now all over Europe, and in this country, even with the history, not only of slavery, but indigenous communities, et cetera, this question of how, how do communities come together to create a future is an academic topic. It's not just a, uh, an irrelevant one. I've already mentioned the issue of stability. If you want to guarantee instability politically, increase in equity. We know that the issue of creating change in our institutions is going to be a complex thing. Of course, Dean and I were talking at lunch today and I thought, you know, if I said, well, let me do it. How many of you know you should exercise more than you do? Okay, now you have total control over you. So why do we think institutional change should be easy, <laughs> right? So 
The question is, how do we create attractive institutions? How do we create change in these complex places? This is a leadership agenda. And when I've looked at leadership institutes across the country, whether for undergraduates or faculty or senior administrators, it's amazing how little time we spend on what does it mean to be a leader in a pluralistic environment. And of course, what we know now in every sector of society, there is a real demand for competence in leading pluralistic organizations, regardless of one's own background. How comfortable are you in serving in that role? And the corporate world is way ahead in saying, we need people who know how to do this. We've seen corporate uh, companies, for example, stop recruiting in engineering schools around the country because they're neither producing diversity in engineering nor engineers who know how to function in diverse environments. So we're not preparing, from an educational point of view, students. So this intersects with almost every discipline we've got, right? Uh, the arts. I spend a lot of time in downtown Los Angeles, and what is clear is if you don't, if you don't interrupt the usual, that audience is getting older and grayer. If you've been to any arts functions lately, you'll see that. So the arts is very concerned. So what do we do to be attractive to diverse communities? Uh, it's got to do with history and science. It's got to do with the kinds of knowledge and skills required. And it also, and this gets right to the heart of your theme, the credibility and the viability of higher education. What is the role of our institutions, particularly the public universities, in addressing these issues? So you see, it's not just about uh, legal challenges to admissions, which is where people want to spend 90% of their time. It's really about the core work of the university and what it's doing and who is being served. Because unless we're going to walk around saying, well, we don't really care about this 60% of the population, which none of us, I think, would at least openly say. Um, we have to ask ourselves this. Now, I'm going to go through this very quickly, but it's, I, it's really important to understand that what's happening on our campuses is the rhetoric about diversity is increasing. We, for many campuses, having more diversity at the undergraduate level. The disparities of graduation rates, just to take one measure, persist. But the human capacity, the capacity of faculty and staff is not necessarily increasing on our campuses. The leadership for this, our host notwithstanding, is often coming from diversity roles, people who have these roles on our campus and are pushing for change. And the thing that really gets me is conversations and task force reports could be 40 or 50 years old. When I go to a campus to spend time, I read all the reports. And I could take 2014, and it would be 1970 all over again. I could take 1970 and change it to 2014. Yeah, this is, you're, you're nodding, thank you. And of course, there are competing views about whether progress is being made. So here's what happens. If I'm a leader on a campus, if I'm the provost or the chancellor, I have to mark progress. So I'm going to point to our progress on diversity. It may be the increasing diversity of our student body. Maybe we've increased the percentage of students on Pell. I'm going to do that. Now, if I switch my hat and then care about institutional issues or faculty hiring, I'm going to sit there and go, but not that, but not that, but not that. Now, if I'm a leader, after a while, that gets really tiring. You know, we're talking past each other. Much more fun to open that new building. Or maybe even in a campus somewhere around the world. So part of the issue here is we've got to interrupt even how we do this work. Because diversity is about so much that it almost becomes impossible to say, how do we know progress is being made? It's often parallel. So strategic plans don't mention diversity, but we have a diversity plan. Accreditation now is beginning to embed diversity, so it's a little easier to say you can't be parallel. And the next one I had to do because the Provo series began because of an incident. So it's often mobilized after a crisis. <laughs> We have a crisis, and we've got to do something, and so we do something. We know now that difficult dialogues are difficult. We have not increased the capacity intentionally to have difficult dialogues about some of these topics. And it's a problem with our campus. And you'll see with my reference to technology in a minute, we spend a lot of time helping increase faculty capacity to have iPads in their classroom. And yet, how much time do we spend helping people have difficult dialogues? in the faculty, between faculty and administration. And now we have internationalization initiatives. If you want to do see something happen fast, look at those. 
And what I observe is those things are happening fast. All kinds of partnerships and agreements. And, you know, and I've had a Fulbright to South Africa. I'm committed to internationalization. I get globalization, I do research around the world, but it's not a substitute for the conversations about diversity. And that's something else that's happening. So what's the next generation of work going to take? And I get a little practical here, except that this is all research-based. What's it going to take? It is about shifting the paradigm, even how we think about this work. And it's about how do we build our credibility and our capacity for a pluralistic society. And people joke about higher education doesn't change very easily. Well, actually, it's changed in a lot of domains. Look at the internationalization. But I want you to think for a second about technology. I never thought that I would spend as much time thinking about when we understood that technology was an imperative, what changed in higher education. That is not how we talk about diversity. When we talk about diversity, we talk about reasons, excuses. We blame K-12, you know, all those kind of stuff. There aren't any, they wouldn't come here, we can't afford them, they're being recruited. I mean, just lots of reasons. With technology, we understood it was an imperative, and we had to do it. We didn't wait for everybody to do agree. We still don't know whether some of it's good or bad, but we're going to do it anyhow. So the question for diversity, like technology, was an imperative for interrupting the usual. So here's you know, really basically five points about how to think about this in the next generation of diversity work. And this really, I think, can work. The first is to locate diversity as part of the mission. Why is it an imperative for this place? So often our work on diversity, sound, we could be talking about any place. Well, this is a land grant university, part of the University of California. It's a research university. Why is it an imperative for the University of California? Not an imperative from Daryl Smith's point of view. I don't really care what my point of view is for you. But why is it an imperative for this place? It's got to be part of core indicators of success or it won't get done. The last time I was on a campus and this campus, I could see it. There's six, seven initiatives. We've got sustainability initiatives. We've got globalization initiatives. We've got service learning initiatives. We've got engagement. What else do you have? Engagement initiatives. If, and I, last I looked, you weren't increasing your staff for all of these initiatives. So if it's not part of core indicators, it's just going to be more work, another program, another thing to do. So it's got to be part of core indicators of success. It cannot be project-itis, more programs. We have a problem, we do a program. The problem is we look to the same people to do the program who've been doing everything else. So if it's not part of the systemic work we do, it will not be sustained and will not happen. And then we have to monitor progress. How do we know we're making progress? And it must be inclusive and differentiated. And what I, by that I mean is, generally we have a definition of diversity in our campuses that's a list of identities that I mentioned in the beginning. Because we want to be inclusive of all of these. The way I've come to think about this is diversity as inclusive and differentiated. And by that I mean, if I care about uh, underrepresented minority folks on our campus and the way our campuses do or don't serve those communities. And if you look at my research, it, heavily on the intersections of race and gender. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be concerned about wheelchair access on your campus or gender identity. Because if I understand the way in which campuses do or don't serve different populations, then I have an obligation to make sure it gets better at these things, right? But it's different. They're differentiated. So if you look at the discourse on gender identity on most campuses, it's about gender neutral bathrooms. It's not about faculty hiring. It's about the climate for someone who makes this transition. If we're talking about disabilities. We're talking about access. We're talking about accommodation. So the diversity list we have is inclusive, but it's differentiated. The issues are different. And it's really important to understand that in moving forward. Otherwise, you go to every faculty search committee, and somebody from Brazil is diversity, well, of course, somebody from Brazil brings a pers another perspective. But it doesn't address the issue of historically underrepresented populations in this country, right? They're differentiated. But be inclusive. We care about all that, but they're different. So this is, and I won't spend much time on it, but this is how I've begun to organize this in a way that I think speaks to campuses. It's around your mission. It's about access and, access and success that, oh, I don't like it when laser pointers are weak. So the first lower left here is access and success. And for me, that is about access and success of historically underrepresented populations. This is the heart and soul of this work 
going back. The second is about climate and intergroup relations. So what is the climate for these different populations? Do people feel engaged, empowered, creating an environment of success, not just students, but faculty and staff as well. And as our campuses get more diverse, how are we doing on crossing boundaries with one another, having conversations? Most of our campuses aren't doing too well. And you know, my feeling is if you can't do well at Davis, what hope is there for New York? And the country certainly isn't doing very well, so this is a big issue. The third domain is fundamentally the academic core of the institution. It's the education and scholarly domain. It's what are we educating for, what research are we doing, what are we trying to address, and of course you're a land grant, so it's about practical things as well as just theoretical things. And the last one is about institutional viability. It's the hiring, it's your strategic mission, it's your faculty diversity. This is how one can organize, and you see climate is about all these groups. We, don't ha we can be quite inclusive there. Hiring, when we look at this, we look at race and gender intersecting, we say, most campuses aren't doing very well. So here's your mission. I don't have to read it to you. It's about serving the people of California. This is all your language. I, I didn't make it up. This isn't aspirational Daryl Smith telling Davis what you should do. This is your strategic plans, your language. Advance the human condition through improving the quality of life for all, not just some. From health, the air we breathe, the food we eat, to how we experience life. Now, if we spend time on just these words, we can then say, how well are you doing? Not just with a random program, but how are we doing? Preparing all students for participation and leadership in a diverse society. You may have programs about that, but if I were the average student in an ag course or a engineering or whatever, Am I being prepared quite intentionally about the concepts of identity, about the history of these issues? Or am I just going off into the world thinking, why can't we just get along? Or why are they so upset about whatever the, you know, the usual kind of conversations? These be resolute, I love this one, in advancing inclusion and equity in our community. Being resolute. So these are all yours, promote diversity and all. And now you're about to become an HSI, yes? So. Let us just make sure that it's Hispanic serving and not just Hispanic enrolling. It's really hard not to be Hispanic enrolling, enrolling in California. What does that really mean? So I'm taking your language and saying, how do you know you're making progress on these things? So I'm going to just link excellence to diversity because so often those of us who care about diversity think it's about excellence and people who aren't thinking about it think, well, all I know is, are you telling me to admit people who aren't qualified? Or, hire people who aren't. I mean, that's sort of the frame. So, student success. Are students from different gr groups enrolling and succeeding? That's an empirical question. I'm a researcher. It's an empirical question. Are all students being prepared to function in this diverse society? I mean, I wouldn't. Why would I want to prepare someone for 1950s? And with technology, we would be very intentional about this. What does it mean to prepare people for a technological society? Do we model a diverse community that works? This is a very important one. What is the model that we present? We know there are lots of models that don't work. How do we model this? And that means how do we build our own capacity? Because most of us have not lived in diverse communities that work. How attractive are you? I can tell you now that the University of California has switched in some of the attractivenesses of the campuses. UC Riverside used to be, eh. It's now one of the more attractive campuses, not just for students, but for people who want to do work in the community, who want to do work to solve some of these issues. It got given a new medical school at a time when there was no money for anything. Well, why? because the Inland Empire, where Riverside is, is one of the most underserved, poorest communities of the state, heavily Latino, and medical schools weren't serving those communities, weren't producing doctors who would serve those communities. They got money. So, attractiveness. Are your faculty and staff from different groups succeeding and thriving? Do we know how to identify and nurture talent from different groups? And mostly the answer is no. We use conventional metrics to identify talent, and then we don't find talent. 
Are we serving and working with diverse community? Does the curriculum and research address academic issues related to diversity? These are academic questions. Are we creating cultural competence? You know, if I'm graduating from a medical school, do I know how to work with my clients from all those identity groups? Not just are we graduating diverse doctors, but are we graduating everybody who feels comfortable and has had experience in working in diverse communities? Are we inclusive? And I've spent a lot of work in medicine lately where you think, this is good science, diversity. Uh, I was just at Cedar sinai You know, this is not an ideological issue when the government required diversity in clinical trials. It wasn't political, it wasn't ideological, it was how do you have good science if you test drugs on only one community? So you have breast cancer drugs being tried on men. 60 Minutes just had a thing on this about a month ago. Because women had pesky hormones. Well, what kind of good design for science is that? The way we eliminate pesky hormones is not to test a drug on women. And this is true, I'm not being facetious. And it's only because we have clinical trials that we know that some of the most popular heart medicate, one of the most popular heart medications may not be so good for African American men. Why is it good science not to have diversity? And do we know how to reach out to diverse communities? Do we have trust in diverse communities? So they'll want to participate. There's a long history of why people don't. So I'm going to, this is kind of pulling together all the lessons from research. You can read this and ask questions if you want. But what we know is that if we're going to make the kind of changes we need to make, we have to stop using myths and assumptions that provide reasons and excuses. Uh, my example of this would be if you had a development officer, an advancement officer, during the financial crisis, who said, you know, I can't raise any money. It's a financial crisis, and a lot of our donors are in trouble. What would happen to that advancement person? Not be here long. But think about the reasons and excuses we have for the state of things, whether it's students, student success, or hiring faculty and staff. It's a lot of assumptions and myths and reasons. We've got empirical evidence about this. We know that leadership at all levels matters. Senior leaders need to be very visible about this. We know that multiple and intersecting identities are important. This is not about projectitis. If you're sitting in a group and someone says, we have a problem, you say, let's do a program. First say, is there some part of our institution that's not doing, has an embedded diversity in its work before we start adding stuff for which we have no staff? We know the intellectual work is critical. For students and student success, what we know is that good education trumps background. And the way I think about that is sort of three pillars of student success. High expectations. So this is not about dumbing down. It's not about lowering standards. High expectations. <clears throat> Belief in students even when they don't believe in themselves. At every level of the student pipeline, what we know is that people, when they encounter a problem, think it's them. Somebody has to be saying, and not you, this is a problem most people encounter. And the support necessary to get them there. And I've summarized, I mean, I've read a lot of research, done a lot of research on this topic. We know that a lot of talent is lost when institutions use traditional metrics. The University of California is a leader in using metrics for admissions that have structural inequity built in. So in the days when Compton High School had no AP and your academic metrics had SAT, number of AT, not even number of AP courses you took of those available, just number and a GPA that was heavily influenced by the number of AP courses you took. Now we wonder why a graduate of Compton High School, this is a real person who was a valedictorian, African American, wanted to be a doctor, got admitted, couldn't, wouldn't even get to the consideration level in the old UC system. Went to USC, is now a doctor in the Central Valley. So these are structurally, these are not excellent, these are, have structural inequities built in. And we know that domestic and international are becoming increasingly interchangeable, and they're not. The faculty diversity one is very important, and I didn't look at any of your data, but you can. Faculty diversity has been one of the slowest areas to change. The international faculty, and by that in, in some of the conventional research, is non-resident, alien, or non-citizen faculty, is the fastest growing group around the country. Somehow we can pay $10,000 and figure out visas but we can't find talented 
folks for faculty hiring. Faculty diversity, we know, tends to manifest itself in particular departments. So if you disaggregate and look at where people are, you won't see them. You'll see a lot of departments with zeros and ones if you look, particularly of women of color in the sciences. You may have some ones for white women, but often a lot of zeros for women of color. We know retention can be an issue. It's easy to calculate. This is the scary part. On most campuses that I know of, the next generation of faculty has been already hired. So we've already got the next generation for a generation fairly well in place, and it's not a whole lot more diverse than the old generation. So we need to be very careful about this. And when I hear campuses talk about we're going to hire 300 faculty, because now we're into growth mode, are you hot? You're going to do that. UCR is going to do that. Then I want to go, OK, who's watching the ship every step of the way to make sure that that 300 looks more diverse? <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at Mo. And, and there's a lot to look, because what you don't want to do is wait till it's done and then be regretful. People are not opposed to diversifying. It's just a million steps along the way where it just falls apart. We know that proactive searches matter. We know job descriptions matter. And we know that accountability matters. If I have an option to do the old post and pray, put an ad in and pray, then I will, because I'm busy. I don't like search committees any more than anybody else does. We know that our graduate students, the pipeline to the faculty, is getting hugely international and not at all diverse. A real problem. We know implicit bias is an issue. And we know that hiring is a central component. And institutions leaders who say we're committed to diversity, and then the hiring doesn't follow, will not be taken seriously. And that's the reality of leadership. Undergraduate students isn't the place It turns out in the research that our reasons for diversifying leadership, faculty and staff, is quite underdeveloped. And if we had time, I'd ask you to think about why is it, why is it important. And most people would say role models. And in their saying that, would say role models for, the, for those communities. And to some degree, that's true. But the reasons are actually more, more profound. It's about the quality of decision making. Who's sitting around the table when decisions get made and landmines go off? Uh, perceptions of commitment. The fact is that students, in fact, there was an article in the LA Times just last week about African-American students making decisions, you know, very skilled African-American students trying to decide what campus they're going to. And it had a lot to do with outreach of the campus by faculty and who the faculty were and what they saw on the campus, not just their peer group. It provides legitimacy. A demo pluralistic democracy that work can say, well, we don't have any of those in our leadership. And the, we know this from the, in the Supreme Court now. The Senate has, you know, th those pictures of all white men sitting up there during um, the Hill hearings didn't give credibility and legitimacy to a democracy. It's about new approaches and scholarship. What we know is the more diverse your faculty, the more diverse your scholarship will be. Absolutely with relationships with diverse communities, your attractiveness, you're not going to be attractive if that leadership group is not diverse. It's about leadership development. We can't keep saying we didn't have anybody in the pipeline for provosts if we haven't produced the faculty and the department chairs and the associate deans who will come along. And this one's very important. Significance of the absence of. It's not that we're going to reach some moment where we'll have the right distribution and it'll mirror and we can argue for the next 10 years whether we should mirror California or PhDs or, you know, the UCS goes nuts with pools, it's zeros. It's the absence of. Ask yourself what percentage of your students have gone through the entire curriculum here and have been taught or not taught by underrepresented faculty in the sciences by white women or underrepresented minority faculty. It's a huge percentage. It's the absence of. So think about that. I've counted. Campuses. I just take the departments, I take race and gender of the counts, and the number of zeros of departments that have none. And if you've got them, it's because it's in ethnic studies or in Spanish or in some department like that. Very important. Role models and, of course, the burden on tokens. As we've gotten more committed to doing diversity work and we have the same number of people around, some of whom are retiring, right? We keep looking for people. In the STEM fields, what you see is, you know, women, white women getting to be department chairs as associate professors because we desperately need to diversify our department chair ranks. 
except that it derails them from their science careers and they didn't get promoted. So this cultural taxation is a direct function of having too few. So the implications for leadership at every level, and this is a faculty issue, an academic issue, an institutional issue, is it's got to be central to mission. Where is diversity absolutely central in the mission of this place in each unit? It's got to be central to your academic and intellectual core. This is not just about nice people getting along. It is about why is this an imperative in the way that technology was an imperative, in the way that sustainability is now an imperative. Um, it's got to be communicated constantly. It's not a matter of going to the diversity plan. It's where does this fit in the core strategic issues for this university. And it's got to be intentional, aligned, accountable, and sustained. We are all too busy to change, unless I have to. And if it's not aligned, can't just be over here. One day we talk about globalization, the next day we talk about diversity, then we're doing sustainability. If it's not aligned, change won't happen. We know that global doesn't eat domestic, and we know that we ha cannot just keep doing the same stuff. Um, it was an article recently about hiring and about in st doing STEM, students in STEM, and was looking at how athletics recruits its students. If we did half of what athletic programs do to find talent and recruit them and nurture them and support them, it's a wonderful model because it gets talent. So we're not talking about not excellent, it's talent. If we did that in physics, I can only begin to imagine what physics would look like. So I'm going to stop with this. The role of the public university in society. It's building capacity to serve that society, a pluralistic society. It's teaching and learning. So what are we teaching? What are we expecting students to learn? It's about identifying talent at every level. In a land grant, it's about solving problems and working with communities to solve problems. And it's about being models of pluralistic communities that work. Because if we don't have a vision of what it means to have pluralistic communities that work, and by that I don't mean kumbaya, we are not setting ourselves off on the democracy we need. And the urgency is just growing. We're in a crisis in this country about our own production of students in STEM, about educational disparities, we really are about nation rebuilding now. If South Africa was about nation building, this is about nation rebuilding. It's how do we mobilize our capacity to really make sure that people in our society thrive. We need everybody to know how to lead a pluralistic society. That's a sophisticated skill for which there is almost no research. There's tremendous impatience. Every time a new leader comes in and says, we're having a diversity plan, everybody's eyes roll, deep breath and go back to your work. And the other is that the next generation, and I don't know about Davis's numbers, you have already hired, or just about are hiring the next generation of faculty. Thank you very much, and let me stop there. I disagree with everything that's been said. Um, actually, it's hard for me to find anything to disagree with. I, I want to thank Provost Hexter, thank Dr. Smith, thank Christina Gonzalez uh, for, for letting me have a, a few minutes to comment on, on, on these, these thoughts. Uh, I mean, to me, it's always been the case um, that a, a public university um, should um, focus uh, on diversity in serving the public of the state of California. I've always thought that at a public law school, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm at a public law school. I wanted to highlight just a few points uh, that I think were particularly salient uh, and important to me in, in um, Dr. Smith's remarks. Uh, and one of the issues is that the diversity issues that we face today are more diverse than they were yesterday. 
Uh, it wasn't that long ago when people thought that Latino civil rights issues weren't civil rights issues at all because the civil rights issues that troubled our society were between African Americans and whites. We, and we still have all those issues, but we have more issues. I was reminded by the impacts of the increased diversity just recently in a relatively mundane matter, I guess. Um, the University of California, as you know, is now a no smoking um, place. And there was an interesting political coalition that developed at the law school. Uh, and it was between the, the international students that we have more of uh, in recent years and the vets we have more of in recent years. And the immigrants, the, the international students, viewed the smoking regulations as anti-immigrant, xenophobic, uh, and something that I should deal with immediately. Um, and the vets said, well, if I can die for my country, why can't I smoke a cigarette in front of King Hall? Uh, and, and so I kind of realized that you know, these, these issues are, 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 our student bodies are becoming more complicated. Uh, and some of the issues they raise are more complex. And, if, and as Dr. Smith mentioned, the, you know, the, the, the dreamers, the undocumented students we see in our campuses, uh, and they are in our campuses, um, they, they uh, affect the diversity of the campus, uh, and their problems are our problems. Um, I, I, another point I'd, I'd, I'd make and emphasize, and I don't want to make any excuses, so I don't, is that in California, the University of California has been hampered by Proposition 209, which has limited what we can do in terms of our admissions. I, I identify that as a problem, not saying it's an excuse, but something that we have to address, but something that we have to work hard intentionally and with accountability in terms of addressing. Um, another point I'd emphasize is the data, 38% uh, of the population of the state of California is Hispanic. Um, but if you're thinking about our pool of applicants, um, Latinos comprise well over 50% of the students in the public schools in K through 12 today. In some places, uh, well over well over that. In the in the K, well, the elementary and secondary school I attended in the San Gabriel Valley, it's over 90% Latino. Uh, and, and there's many districts in the state that are that way. And if we're thinking about the pool of potential applicants, we should expect a, con a continually growing Latino one. While diversity among students is rising to a certain extent, uh, diversity growth among faculty is, is a slower project. And I say project because I think it's a work in progress. Uh, and that's not that surprising because the population is changing, the demographics, the universities are changing, and it takes some time for that to percolate through, through, through the system. Um, so um, I, I do think that we have a number of issues. It's not just excuses. Uh, that we have to deal with, but there are issues of implicit, implicit bias. Um, and I actually, I commend the Vice Provost's Office for so focusing uh, on implicit bias in a variety of educational programs for the campus. Uh, when, I, when I mentioned to, to Mo, not um, um, Stanton, not Stapleton, uh, uh, I, I, uh, she, she quickly corrected me and said that, you know, there are other places that are doing this too, but I don't think any place is doing it as effectively and as intentionally and as concertedly as we are at UC Davis. At the same time, I don't think we're done with ex express bias in certain respects. I think if Do the Donald Sterling incident taught us anything, it's that some people hold views, sometimes they share them, sometimes they don't. I don't think that's as prevalent, nearly as prevalent on UC campuses or university campuses, um, but you know, it's still an issue we have to deal with. I, I can't agree more uh, with this idea that if we have diversity efforts, they have to be part of our core functions. They can't be ancillary to strategic plans. Uh, they can't be ancillary to accreditation reports. Uh, they, they have to be central and core to those. Um, now, we get inspected by the American Bar Association, and um, one of the things they look at is the diversity of the student body and diversity of the faculty. Um, but the only time they really raise it is if there's a problem. Uh, there's very little effort to say there's, you know, there's good things going on here and if it, you, you should be moving more in this direction or, or uh, these efforts you've taken are commendable uh, and you're contributing to the excellence of your unit by, uh, by doing what you're doing. Instead it's, well, if, if you're not, we've never had this problem, but I know other schools do. Uh, if you have a problem, it's, it's, it's mentioned as a problem and a problem area to address. Uh, another area uh, that's it's, it's not, it's important to law schools, important to universities. Uh, U.S. news reports on law school uh, rankings, uh, they have a, a separate, a collateral diversity index, 
but doesn't factor into their rankings of law schools. So um, very few law schools that are in the, are in the top 50 uh, also are uh, in the top 50 when it comes to diversity rankings. There's a, a collateral and, and separate sort of set of rankings. I also think that I agree wholeheartedly, Dr. Smith, that um, oftentimes diversity efforts are mobilized through after a crisis. Uh, and I, I think, generally speaking, that's not a good thing. But I have to say um, that it, sometimes a crisis can be used to good benefit. Uh, I was fortunate to be hired in 1989 at the School of Law, a long time ago now. And there was a crisis on the faculty, and there was a great deal of concern because it was an all-white faculty. Uh, and, the, and the view was that, um, that you couldn't be a top law school if you're an all-white law school. And that year, uh, the, the, the committee had specific directions, that a, it a committee that was committed to a diverse outcome, and, that, and three minority faculty members were hired. Uh, and actually, I was fortunate to be one of them. Uh, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that since then, there's been a, a, a radical transformation in the composition of the law faculty. Um, in part because the faculty has been attentive to the issue, has been focused on the issue, uh, and I can't imagine, I was given it some thought, I can't imagine how you would get out of the first year of law school at, at UC Davis School of Law without having a woman or person of color teaching you at some point that year, and, and I can't imagine how it would even be possible to attend three years of law school without taking a, a course, uh, or probably more courses, uh, than that from a, from a person of color or a woman. Actually, a few years ago, I mistake, I mis I, inadvertently, that's how I'll put it, I appointed a, um, a faculty appointments committee, uh, and then somebody after the facts said, you didn't appoint any white males to that committee. And I suggested, well, there's a pool problem. We don't have any qualified <laughs> white males to, to serve on that committee. But it was totally inadvertent that I, well, maybe there was implicit bias. Um, but it, it, I, I think that it was uh, because um, we had a diverse group of people to choose from, and we, we selected, I selected a diverse group. Um, but but I, I do think um, ra the crisis is not ordinarily the best place to start your diversity efforts. It should be a regular uh, and, and, and normal part of business. Now, I want to talk a, a little bit about uh, faculty hiring because it's something that I focus a lot of my scholarship on in thinking, thinking about um, in recent years. And, and I want to uh, um, recommend to you a book. Um, it's entitled Presumed Incompetent, The Intersections of Race and Class for Women in Academia. And it's, it's an anthology of readings and it's uh, edited by Angela Harris, who's a professor at the School of Law, and Carmen Gonzalez, uh, another law professor. And it offers a lot of things that I had thought about but had never really verbalized. Uh, and it was very helpful for me to think about, about um, you know, what the experiences would be, particularly of women of color, but also women and men of color as well. Uh, and, and, and I came up with a, a number of, uh, of sort of takeaway points for me from that book. One is, and this is, this is obvious, and maybe it, it should be obvious, but it's not, not always implemented. Um, we should always intentionally conduct searches that will yield a pool of, fact, of, of candidates of color. Uh, if you don't have a diverse pool, you're never going to have diverse outcomes. Uh, and so you have to focus throughout the process uh, on making sure that you have, you, you can never dictate if you're a leader or not the outcome of a process, but you can take steps to try to maximize the potential for success. Uh, and, and if you don't have a, a pool of candidates from diverse backgrounds, you're not going to end up hiring any candidates from diverse backgrounds. Um, this requires consciousness and intention. And actually, on a number of occasions, I've, I've been involved with search committees at the, at the law school, uh, but also putting panels together for conferences. And there'll be a group of well-intentioned people, and then we'll go through all the, the traditional criteria for selecting people, and then they'll say, gosh, there are no women or, or people of color in, uh, on these panels or, or, or in the pool. And I'll say, that's what basically I've been talking about without saying it for the last uh, you know, several days, that we should look at so-and-so and others, in part because um, you know, it's, not, it's just not going to happen. These things don't, just don't happen by, by chance. Um, the, the other thing, um, and, and I think it was implicit in, in Dr. Smith's remarks, I think we have to evaluate our credentials for excellence. 
Uh, some super elite credentials can be awe-inspiring, but really shrink the diversity of a pool. Um, for, for example, in law schools, something that's very popular to look for in candidates is somebody who's clerked for the Supreme Court, a uh, Supreme Court justice, um, and, and it's it's sort of the, the the gold standard for a faculty candidate. Well, the truth of the matter is there's probably been two Mexican Americans who have ever served as a justice of the Supreme Court. It's usually 80% men, uh, white men, who served as, just, uh, as clerks to the to Supreme Court justices. And some justices have never hired a woman clerk or a person of color as a clerk. So if you focus on uh, that kind of elite credential, you're not going to have any a diverse pool or a diverse pool of applicants to, to, of candidates to choose from. Uh, another example, suppose you focus, and some law schools do this, I'll focus only on graduates of Yale Law School and Harvard Law School. Uh, Yale has a tradition of, uh, and I know because most years I go and I talk to the two Mexican-American students who are in the first year class um, because they're looking for somebody to talk to. Um, and and, um, and when they're giving a lecture or something, I'll talk to them. There's, there's, it's kind of like Noah's Ark there in terms of Latino enrollment. Uh, there's two out of a class of 200. Uh, the same is true uh, at, at Harvard for the most part. Uh, sometimes it's buried in numbers like, well, the overall Latino enrollment is 10 percent, um, but um, you know, the underrepresented Latinos, uh, the non-Cubans, uh, the non-elite uh, Puerto Ricans are, are often very small. But if you limit your searches to y Yale, Yale and Harvard, for example, or to Supreme Court clerks, you're going to have a very low diversity ratio in your pool. Uh, another area that, that I've thought about considerably, and there's a lot of studies on this, is that uh, we often focus on teaching, and I think we should focus on teaching in hiring, um, but students in doing teaching evaluations often carry covert and overt uh, race attitudes and biases, and gender biases. Uh, as associate dean of the law school for 10 years, I read every teaching evaluation for every faculty member uh, and I can tell you a, a number of things. It's consistent with studies done by, among others, Deborah Merritt, uh, is that um, women often are commented on differently than men. Uh, it's, I've only run across a rare situation where, where a student would comment on the dress of a woman, um, uh, uh, of, a, of a man, and often comment on the, the attire of women, should dress nicely, more nicely, or dress is really cool, uh, <laughs> things like that. You never see that uh, in, in men's evaluations for the most part. Um, but women of color often are really beat up in teaching evaluations, particularly in the first few years of teaching. Now, now that can impact the hiring decisions if you don't sort of filter those evaluations through an understanding that women and people of color um, face uh, challenges in the classroom and it not, may not necessarily have to do with their teaching excellence or their teaching qualifications, but may have to do with who they are uh, in terms of identity. Um, but there are an incredible number of, of studies uh, on this topic just showing that men uh, of color, women of color, and women on the average have lower teaching evaluations numeric student teaching evaluations than, than um, white men. Um, one last thing I'll mention and I'll, and I'll, I'll stop is uh, I do think it's important uh, in these times of internationalization to understand, uh, and I know this, Dr. S Dr. Smith mentioned this, that um, domestic minorities aren't the same thing as international um, you know, faculty or students who share similar, similar somewhat similar ancestries. Um, it, is not necessarily the case that a student from Mexico has anything in common with a Mexican-American student in the United States. Different backgrounds, different histories, often different class uh, backgrounds as well. Um, and, and it's also not the case that, that uh, the diversity just in, in some communities among African-Americans uh, and uh, African immigrants are all that common. Or among Latinos, I remember uh, one of my experiences from uh, Harvard Law School was uh, everybody would say, oh, uh, you know, you're Mexican, you should go talk to this guy who was Central American, the son of a general from El Salvador. I said, well, I don't have anything in common with that, that person. Why would I want to go talk to, to them? I later represented people who fled uh, the general and his army. Um, but um, but, but it's, uh, it, it is in these case, cases, it's not necessarily the case that international students 
uh, on our campuses or international faculty will have particular affinities with domestic minorities with very different experiences and very different backgrounds. So, and that's kind of obvious, but it's also something that um, doesn't often get the attention I think that, that it deserves. Uh, and, and there is a suspicion, I know, in minority communities that there's a focus on international minorities as opposed to domestic ones. Uh, and it's been mentioned to me many times by African Americans, why are they, why are they hiring on faculties um, Jamaicans as opposed to domestic African Americans? Um, so I, I think that's, that's an issue that requires our attention. And I'm not suggesting that we never hire immigrants. I'd be far, far from the truth, anything I would stand for. Um, but I do think it, it requires attention and an understanding of the very diverse communities that, that we're dealing with. Uh, here, because that kind of sensitivity is, is very, very important. Uh, and now, in the end, I think what I take from a lot of Dr. Smith's remarks is that we have to be conscious, intentional, and vigilant uh, year after year, time after time, uh, search after search, if we want there to be outcomes. And, and hopefully, we, those outcomes can be rewarded, um, you know, with, with um, you know, Resources are always good, uh, but other, other things as well. Uh, and, but, I, but I do think that rewards are sort of critical to making things happen in this area because you get rewards for other things if you're a leader, but getting rewards for diversity I think are important as well. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm excited about this forum. Uh, however, I have to chide both Daryl and Kevin for basically saying everything I had planned to say. Uh, so I will keep my comments very short. And just to say, Daryl mentioned a number of times the critical situation we have with diversifying our pipeline and our faculties in the STEM disciplines. And as, as a scientist myself, I want to come from that per particular perspective because I think STEM disciplines are way behind many other fields in terms of understanding what diversity is really about. Um, and so I just wanted to mention a few things that I think STEM faculty in particular need to know. Um, and you know what? What would I like if a little piece of paper that would be below the pillow at night? What would be five or six things on that piece of paper that I would like absorbed into the cerebral cortex? What are those things? Students have noticed that we don't look like they do anymore, and it matters to them. All right, I'm in a discipline where. We're picking the best graduate students from the country. They're 52% women. Our faculty are much, much less diverse, just in the gender dimension, much less the racial, the dimensions of race, ethnicity, disability, et cetera. Second, we cannot wait for the pipeline to mature until we, to, to hire new faculty. A very simple calculation would suggest, if you look at the graduating seniors from the California high schools right now, our incoming students, if you will, they are well over 40% what we call underrepresented or historically underrepresented minorities. If we keep hiring faculty from underrepresented groups at the same proportion of our current faculty that we have been doing for the last what we were, did between 2006 and 2012, for example, it'll take us over 150 years to reach 40% underrepresented minorities. That's not acceptable. A similar calculation for women, particularly in STEM, uh, suggests a figure of at least 60 or 70 years. Uh, as uh, Daryl mentioned or, or made clear implicitly in her talk, Faculties are long-lived. <laughs> There's a very slow turnover rate, and so it takes a long time to change them. Third, we don't really know what excellence looks like unless it looks just like us. Okay? Um, we, there's an ocean of talent out there that did not go to the same schools, 
we do, the, who do not have the same professional and research priorities we do, who do not have the same family and ge family obligations and geographic constraints that we do, or lacks, lack of constraints that we do. Um, and one of the most important things, and the reason why my office and now our UC Davis Advance and STED programs are going to be building this program, a whole reason for uh, training or teaching faculty about implicit and structural biases uh, and about the diversity imperative is that is to get across the point that we don't necessarily we have to broaden our views of what what actually represents excellence. Kevin did an, uh, gave some wonderful examples of this. Um, there is a uh, number five. Not everyone thinks an academic career is the best thing they could possibly do with their lives. And unfortunately, academia has, particularly in the STEM disciplines, has a reputation for being incompatible with things that are important to many, many people. Things like having families. <laughs> uh, things like being close to family. Things like giving back to your community of doing community-engaged research, of doing applied research. One of the big issues I think we face in a R1 research university is that we have a tradition of valuing fundamental theoretical research more than applied research. Okay. Are you a theoretical physicist solving the fundamental issues of the origin of the universe? Or are you an experimentalist? All right. Are you a mathematician or are you applied mathematician? Are you developing statistical theory or are you doing applied statistics? These are, frankly, we have some biases. Uh, and because it's clear that women and underrepresented minorities uh, are more inclined on average to do applied or engaged research to do activities that give back to their communities, we better start figuring out how to recognize the value of those activities and rewarding them in the merit and promotion process. And this is something that the Advance Policies and Practices Committee will be tackling as one of their major areas for making uh, suggestions for improvement. Linda Besson, a name many of you know, has taken this issue and her co-director uh, Jonathan Eisen and are just running with it. It's, it's really quite exciting. I want to talk about one other thing in, and in terms of looking at diversity. That is another one of those dimensions of diversity. Lots and lots of women particularly drop out of the pipeline, particularly for STEM through the process of graduate school. They may complete their degrees, <laughs> but they start graduate school and they think, this is the best thing ever. I want to do this. I want to do science. I want to be an academic scientist. I want to do, be at a research university. And many, many of them, by the end of their PhD t uh, time, have decided, no, not for me. Why is that? I think a lot of this has to do with the perception that what we expect as faculty members, their, their mentors, who don't look at all like them <laughs> for the most part, um, that we have not done the things with our lives that they think are important to them. Um, I, every time I see that we've hired or we're interviewing, or particularly we've hired, a female faculty member who is clearly about five months pregnant, I cheer. Why do I cheer? Because that is someone who will come into our academy and will be seen, it is, I admit, a somewhat limited role model role, but that is someone who demonstrates this is a career that can accommodate all of those things. Now, note that we, I do not cheer necessarily when a young father or father-to-be comes in the door because typically I'm not seeing that the evidence of that of that family and and I have to say this is a huge issue we need to recognize as faculty that um, 
there is, for example, a very well-documented motherhood penalty. Men and women do this. They share this bias. But if you give any hints that a woman is a mother or about to be a mother, all our perceptions of her professionalism, her, her qualifications, all decline. That does not happen for men. In fact, if anything, a perception of, the, of a man as a father actually gives a slight bump, typically, for those ratings. This is absolutely something we must, must, must change and fight against that tendency. We know, just let's look at some data from UC Davis, the Coach uh, Faculty Workplace Climate Survey. Um, what are we looking at? Lots of our faculty have children. Men and women on our faculty are equally likely to have dependent children, 57%. Uh, but for example, underrepresented faculty are much more likely to have dependent children than the other groups. So when we talk about being receptive and inclusive and appreciative and supportive of fa faculty who are also uh, establishing their families, this is a huge diversity issue. Uh, um, we also know associate professors, for example, are more likely to have children at home than are the other ranks, both assistant and full. Sometimes we, we forget <laughs> that. Um, faculty women are 13% more likely to have professional spouses than faculty, than male faculty are. What does this mean in terms of the distribution of childcare responsibilities, workload at home? Um, one other thing, Asian American faculty. Our Asian American faculty are 30 to 40% more likely to have adult dependents than their peers. All right, these are demographic features that emerged from our study. This means that we must be much better at not only welcoming uh, faculty who, are, who want to have fulfilling lives in many ways, including having families outside of academia, uh, but that we must change our policies and we must bring all those implicit biases we have out into the sunlight. And discuss them, recognize them, and try to fight them. So with that, I am going to stop so we have time for questions. Okay, so maybe I'll ask the first question. <laughs> Inertia is a very powerful force. And how do we interrupt the usual? I haven't been able to figure this out. You often see situations that you identify as the usual, right? The usual problem. But how can we stop it? One of the things that I've observed, and it still holds true as I continue to kind of do field work on this, is if it's not an imperative, we won't interrupt it. Fundamentally, this institutional change won't happen if the institution is saying, we're holding people accountable, it's going to change. We cannot wait. We didn't, we didn't with technology. When it was an imperative, we did things. We're continuing to do stuff with technology. In the middle of the financial crisis, we did social media. Why? Because, not because everybody loves social media, but because you can't do business in enrollment and in communication without building your capacity for that. So for me, the issue is, is it an imperative? It's mm -hmm. if it's not, just do your work and be a lovely person. <laughs> but nothing is going to change dramatically. And I, and, and I think for many of our institutions, it's, and that's where the public university, uh, you know, the, I was with uh, the Regents group who was holding campuses accountable, doing metrics, and I thought, this was the same group that wasn't so pro-diversity. And a number of the regions, I said, why are you doing this? And a number of the regions said, the University of California, whether it wants to or not, serves the people of California. And the last time we looked, the people of California were more diverse. So I'm hoping that all the constituent groups will say, not an option. Otherwise, we will do the usual. OK, well, I'm sure there will be questions. Yes, Griselda. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Griselda Gastor, I'm a long-time retiree from UC Davis, and I really appreciate what all of you said because there are issues that I literally wake up thinking about, and I say, they live with me every day, even though I'm retired, I haven't retired from educational <laughs> equity, and I work with the public schools and local community colleges on this issue. And I think my question is, I agree with you, it, it, it has to be an imperative. I see the urgency and the imperative every day in my community. Um, this week, I saw in the news that China had surpassed the United States for the first time as the number one economic world power. I was not surprised. I was surprised that it took this long. In working with the undergraduates here, I see the support they have from their country where they have a nation-building agenda that we have seemed to lost. We had it after World War II, and we built the greatest student affirmative action program that built the middle class that benefited mostly white males. It gave us a little bit of diversity, but somehow with the income inequality, and I've read all the five or six books that are on the bestsellers list that shows what's happened to our tax base, as we as a country has divested from higher education, we've lost that nation building imperative just when we have a diverse population at the doorstep. So how can educators across the nation, across the state, build that um, national dialogue and um, involved our uh, government in having the political will to fix the tax base, to reinvest in education so that we don't get behind. You know, we're, we're number two and in a few years will be less because the graduation rates and the, um, the uh, achievement gap is still great, even though the headlines say more Latinos enrolled and more community. Co the problem is that we still have so many rights of omission that, as you said, the studies now say the same thing. The first research study I participated at Stanford in the 70s said if you get promising undergraduate and give them a four-year education, give them the premier, they will rise to the challenge and become leaders. If we create all these rights of omission and send them to community college first, they get lost. There's lots of remediation steps where they get lost. If we have the political will to have that conversation about 209 and saving the economy of the state, of the country, being that world power, we might be able to have some traction. So how can higher education play a leadership role in, in engaging that national dialogue? I, I want to be provocative, and then I'll encourage Mo and Ken to be provocative back to me. I think higher education has been part of the problem. I, you know, I, I have written this book on diversity's promise, which is pulling together all the research that we have. I never mentioned affirmative action in it once. I didn't mention 209 in it once. If you look at most of the research in higher education, most of the discussion in the public universities, it's about the legal challenges. And I, I absolutely agree those have been challenges and all those little quick and easy parallel processes that higher education created because it didn't want to look at the core metrics for talent. In other words, the faculty of the UCs didn't want to change how AP counted in the academic index. And so we had to create these other processes, which over time the Supreme Court is basically keeps saying, no, no, no. To me, what the message is, it's about talent identification. And it's, we have taken, we've created parallel processes. We know if the university of, I mean, this is where it has to be an imperative for the university. If we keep blaming K-12, if we keep blaming the policymakers, if we keep saying it's about the money, I mean, those are real issues. I have no question about it. But if we said it is not acceptable to have hiring patterns that we've had, and, the, and this is where leadership matters, and it's a collective leadership as well, and this is where the faculty have to be leaders as well, it's not an excuse. The disaggregate, you know, WASC has finally said, we're gonna hold you accountable for disaggregated graduation rates. It's taken them 20 years to do that, but okay. We know what to do to interrupt those things, uh, but we keep blaming everybody else. And I think it's, when it came to technology, we figured it out, we did it. It's just not, we can't have reasons and excuses. It's an atrocity 
that we have the number of students coming in who want to be pre-med. You know, it's not a problem with K-12. We've got a lot of students who come in wanting to do pre-med until they hit organic chemistry. Now, we know that if you redo organic chemistry to be a more engaged organic chemistry, students will go to med school. So we have lost talent. I think about in the PhD, in the graduate student pipeline, the people we've lost, but no, no, we're going to blame K-12. And K-12, there are issues there, and we have a role to play there as well. So I, I get pretty impatient with the 209. I was at UCLA after 209, and the faculty were, oh, we can't do anything about hiring now because 209, 209. Well, I had looked at their data pre-209, and they hadn't done very well then either. So uh, I'm being provocative. Yes, Jesse? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jesse Ann Owens. I'm Dean of Humanities, Arts, and Cultural Studies. And I just, uh, this has been such a wonderful event. Um, and I just <clears throat> think that Mo's a reminder to all of us how long it's going to take uh, if we continue in our current paths. And, and uh, Kevin's very uh, useful story about how the law school finally began to change. And I, I think we have it uh, in the UC a remarkable program in the President's uh, Postdoctoral Fellows Program. Uh, and now that's been expanded somewhat to the Chancellor's Fellows Program. And I just have to say, um, I look down the street and see that Berkeley embraces that. And that's not the case right now at UC Davis. And I think it's a, um, I, I don't quite understand why we're not able to embrace that program fully. I think it's partly um, leadership, it's partly Senate leadership, uh, but um, if we are ever really going to change the diversity among the faculty on this campus, I think we have to do all the things that you all were talking about. Uh, the, the hiring patterns, but also take advantage of the pools, the really remarkable pools from the Chancellor's uh, postdoctoral fellowships um, and the president's postdoctoral fellowships. These are, are, are recent PhDs who have gone through an incredibly rigorous competition. They are the best of the best and we'd be lucky to have them and somehow that message is not happening on our campus uh, to the degree that I'd like to see. Yeah, I think we, we talk about how we can enrich our pools develop diverse pools. The President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program and Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program is a nationwide pool of very qualified young scholars uh, and scientists, uh, all of whom have been vetted by system-wide Senate committees uh, and the Chancellor's uh, postdocs go through a second uh, committee of, of review by Senate faculty on each campus. Um, if you want a really great pool, there it is. Uh, I'd love to see that pool enriched in the STEM disciplines, uh, and that is that is something. Trying to get the word out more about about that, um, and it is true. Uh, we. We grant search waivers. It's a very rare thing for us to grant search waivers for, for uh, uh, Senate faculty positions. We grant search waivers, but we've recently put in a layer of Senate review. Uh, and it slowed us down a little bit. Um, and I have to say, competition for these folks is very, very fierce. So uh, my, my sense is I would like to see us uh, have a more expedited process. Um, and uh, that is, but I, I will say, they, you don't do that process without the Senate being on board. And I, and I feel that, and I honestly believe, I think the majority of the Senate here is probably on board. Uh, and hopefully it's going to be discussed at uh, a representative assembly uh, meeting and a series of meetings. Because I think, I, I, th I would like to see us take away any sort of barriers we have at this point for, for recruiting these folks successfully. Um, but, you know, it's not, this is not the thing you impose on the Senate. The Senate needs to, to believe in it. So. Back there. Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sierra Main, I'm a fourth year undergrad animal science major. So I just wanna say I appreciate 
this and being a woman of color and walking in and being pulled in by my lovely <laughs> a friend here, I, I just appreciate this for one. Um, but I have a question on how do students, undergrads, support this, having more faculty and staff of, diverse, of all diversities? Um, I'm very involved in my community, but also um, ally to the LGBTQIA, to Latina, Latino communities, all types of communities. So I want to bring this out to my cohorts and say, okay, they're working on it. Because when we see it in this way, we don't see it, we don't see it like they're actually working on it, you know? We, we can do our protests or whatever, but we don't really see action of this is actually happening. So I appreciate that this mm -hmm. is actually going on. But how, as undergraduates, can we make our voice heard in the correct manner? And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Want to tackle that, Daryl? Sure. I think, actually, students can play a very important role. Sometimes our, you know, when sometimes it's protests. <laughs> but, but more than that, I think, the question, there's nothing stopping leadership in the students from asking, well, are we making progress? Show me the numbers. And the problem is that the numbers often get reported and they're not always as good as we'd like them to be anyhow at the undergraduate level. So I would say you can ask for those things and then, and I think the pressure has to come from all quarters. I mean, most faculty care about students. The search processes get lost in the minutia of search processes. It's not that people are opposed <laughs> to diversifying but it's like death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if everything doesn't align, because often the pool is not diverse enough, so everything has to align on this one candidate we brought to campus. Well, you know, if, a white, if there are three white males and it doesn't work with this one, it works with that one. But that's not how we do it. So I think students asking those questions is very important. I think just how you described yourself suggests you're, you're becoming that leader for a pluralistic yeah, society right. that understands how to cross boundaries and to create kind of coalitions of that. The other is to say, okay, we're gonna make sure we know how to do this because when we leave this place, we're gonna be part of that future pluralistic society that works as opposed to the one that doesn't work. So I think there's a student to student side. But I think asking for the basic metrics and not just the overall metrics because it could be 150 years, but the new <laughs> hires. So if we hired 100 people and in the ag school, if you hired however many you hired, how many did you hire? and just keep asking those questions because it's, it is a very important resource for change. I'd just like to point out, I think you'll have the most impact in your department. You know, so your department is gonna be really invested in you, their majors. And it's important to let the faculty know, you know, we, we, we what would you advise us to do? We don't see our, you know, we are struggling to see ourselves in this. We love this discipline. We're excited about it. We want to go on. Um, but how do we do it? We don't see ourselves in the faculty now. And it's not, is diversity important to you? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's fair to ask your, your faculty that question. I, again, in my discipline, it was a consortium of women graduate students who, who basically said, you know, you're not modeling the kind of community, academic community, that we see ourselves as. You know, so. and you've got curricular aspects of this too, outreach to communities. You know, you think about agriculture and think, okay, how are we developing that? I was just at, um, maybe I shouldn't name names because we're being filmed, but I was recently at a land-grant institution that shall go nameless, and um, it has a hotel school. and. Um, <laughs> There was no diversity to speak of, not only in the faculty, but in the curriculum. And yet there was a sustainability plaque on the wall that says, we are going to prepare every one of our hotel school graduates to understand the complexity of sustainability in the hotel industry. Sustainability. So, you know, you're not going to graduate anybody who doesn't know how to run a hotel sustainably. And I'm thinking, and you're not going to help build their capacity to run a hotel in a pluralistic environment with, hmm? 
And the students were saying, basically, they didn't feel they were given any capacity. You know, and just because I'm who I am doesn't mean I understand how to do this work. So I think the curricular aspects of what are we teaching also relates to who mm -hmm. we hire and those job descriptions. There's a question here, yes. I have a okay. question. Oh. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, for presenting with your information. I'm, uh, I'm the 11th child in a family of 15, the first to go to UC or to any major university. I was a farm worker in California, born and raised. And I have a lot of questions about how come from the time I started here to now, not, not a lot has changed. I'm a registered nurse at UC Davis Health System on a transplant metabolic unit. I remember clearly living through border patrol raids where men were running for their lives in Modesto, in Central Valley, and living up in Madison near here. And Dean John, because of what you said and because of your background, I'm thinking of going to law school. It's just an aside, but I'm thinking to myself, we'd be lucky to have you. Where can I have the most impact? Because as Griselda knows me from 1986 when I started here, um, I now, I was pre-med at the time and I heard things from my white friends and I call them my brothers really, things like if I had your skin and your last name, I could go to any medical school. And these are things that at the time I didn't have a, a real good place to put this, these feelings. And I think as I look forward, right, now I, I'm working with young people, mentoring kids at UC Davis. I call them kids, young people at UC Davis. And I'm looking at one of them thinking, I want him to be faculty at UC Davis School of Medicine when he's done. He's just starting in the fall. And I think about my Asian brothers and sisters and the good job that many of these communities do to support their students. And I, I'm fortunate to have found a partner who can share with me information that was probably would have been locked to me for a long time. And some of the information that I've gleaned is that the newspapers in Asian communities have a heavy focus on education, about how to do well in your SAT score, how to do well in your school, how to, and I think about my community, my community, Tulare County, some say the Appalachia of the West, I don't know. All I know is that it, it was hard, but it wasn't insurmountable. I mean, I've got five or six family members who have college degrees, one's in, and anesthesiologists and teachers and social workers and educators. It's doable, you can. But I wanna know how I can be an uh, echo chamber for what I'm hearing here today, because I do want my government leaders to hear my voice, but more importantly, I want my community to hear my voice. And so that little girls being born today in 17 years when they're looking at edu college and they're facing pressure. They don't, they don't have to feel the pressure of, well, you should get married and go to work. And I really, really am tired of that. That it, it just, it, it really gets old. And so I want to know how I can do that use like, using whatever resources we have on campus or anywhere else and any suggestions. I like the idea about using sports and how they recruit. And I'm seriously, that is a great idea. And I wonder if there's any books that can help me, guide me in that direction, because I'd like to use that metaphor, that way of, of approaching it. In fact, the Chronicle of Higher Education just this week talked about, was that, maybe it wasn't the Chronicle, I was just talking about, it was talking about not only the sports parallel. You know, how is it we have all these basketball, baseball players from the Dominican Republic? They didn't just come to baseball because it's somehow, in the, I mean, this is all very intentional. But this article that I just read said, you know, we've got a lot of young men in communities who do sports. But a lot of those sports leagues do not spend a lot of time talking to them about academic paths. And rather than put them as opposites of one another, use those teams and others to begin to say, we're gonna be very intentional about your academic careers. And you've got coaches and others who've been through this system to really begin to make that intentional. So this, this article was suggesting actually use the sports, don't, not just as a parallel for how we recruit, but use the existing uh, soccer leagues and basketball leagues to reach young 
people who are invested in sports and think that if they become, they'll become an NBA player and instead begin to talk to them about the, the connection between academics and sports. We have two more questions. I think you have been trying to speak for a while. Say, I, I'm not hearing you. How do we teach implicit bias to all faculty and not only to the ones that are interested in the subject? I, uh, I'll tell you what uh, the advance and STED programs are doing. Uh, this year, so, and this relates to Daryl's comment, uh, UC Davis is at the beginning of the process of hiring it, the next generation of faculty. We are going to have a lot of hires over the next six or seven years. So many that the face, we will be, will be a total failure if we do not substantially and fundamentally change the face of our faculty. And so because we felt this was such an imperative, uh, this was our first big year of hiring uh, post, uh, post the recession. Um, as the advanced program is developing its implicit bias workshops uh, and diversity workshops, um, the provost and I just felt like we cannot wait. And so my, my office, with Ralph's support, uh, basically set a rule. At least three members of every search committee need to attend the workshop. Now what is going to happen, our program, our STEP program is going to follow University of Michigan uh, model uh, for their STRIDE program, basically works like this, that faculty will have to be certified uh, for uh, diversity and bias uh, awareness uh, by participating in a STEP workshop uh, every three years if they intend to search on a, serve on a faculty search committee. Uh, we are also going to ask that all members of faculty review committees uh, be certified for uh, uh, understanding of diversity and implicit bias. So basically, it was a bit of a hammer. Uh, on the other hand, the good news is, uh, and let me just say, it's a great way to motivate faculty because a lot of faculty want to search, uh, serve on search committees. This is. This is where the action is, and if you're a faculty member, it's hiring more faculty and having a voice in that process. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, we've had over 300 faculty on the main campus uh, go through the workshops this year, another 200 to 300 at the School of Medicine. Uh, so, and at least we hope that a number of people got information and understanding they did not have before. It's not about preaching, it's about conveying information that particularly people in STEM typically don't know. Okay, then, we have time for a final question. Let, let me just say that this, this is one of the, the, the newer tools because it doesn't blame people. You don't go through this saying, oh, you, you're, you're a racist, because it turns out from the research on implicit bias, you can't live in the society without having it cognitive. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all kinds of cognitive neuroscience. So it's actually a very effective tool. But the issue is not optional. If we want to have search processes that work, now the other piece of this, I think, is sitting down with department chairs and say, you know, you have no record of hiring, or if, let's say, it's a toxic environment, you're not getting a search. With all of these searches, we've got levers now to say, you're not getting a position if you're going to eat people up and spit them out. So what are you doing to create an environment of support? This should be a culture of success for faculty, as well as a culture of success for students. And that's a big lever, but it, it does require... Okay, last question over there. Yes. I have a question. I have a question, uh, which is a technical uh, question. We have oh. the last question over here, I'm sorry. But if you want, you can go ahead. We can have two more, OK? Well, I'm not going to fight over it, but <laughs> you go ahead. So my name is, my name is Josephine Now, and I'm new here at UC Davis, but not new to the UC system. And I am the graduate diversity officer in humanities, arts, cultures, 
social sciences and, and education. Uh, along with the, the mention that um, Dean Stanton uh, said about having folks that are trained uh, in terms of bias, uh, there's also a lot of other ways to bring faculty along. And what are the thought processes there in terms of how else to train our faculty? For example, I can think of training to understand how to uh, attract a, a wider pool, a diverse pool, uh, is another very, very significant component of this, these processes of changing the, the uh, look and the, the uh, demographics of our faculty. Uh, uh, great question. I, I'm sorry to dominate, but li this was a big issue at my vice provost, system-wide vice provost meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, and in fact, uh, many of you are aware that we're using a single uh, software platform called UC Recruit for all our faculty recruitments now. Uh, the for number one reason is so that we can collect data on uh, and across the whole UC system, the power of 10 here really is important, particularly for looking at things like the intersection of race and gender. Um, but now there's there are more really important modules coming coming in. Next year on our campus, we will have and we will be encouraging departments to use, candidates will be given an opportunity to describe their uh, contributions to diversity in the application process. We will also be very strongly encouraging uh, departments to encourage that they use that uh, capacity. But really importantly, there will be, hopefully this is going to happen, rollout system-wide. We are going to be using a survey instrument for search committee chairs to ask them, we'll have all the data for the search itself, right? Then we're going to ask the search committee chairs, what practice, which of the following, there are literally a couple, a hundred of these, which of the following practices did you use and to what extent? Uh, and, and this is a research project. It's going, it's, this is not about punishing. This is, this is an effort to use the power of the UC size to try to find out what practices actually work because there, there are hints in the literature. There are a few things that we know. We know it's important to get a diverse pool, all right? Uh, but there are lots of other recommendations out there for which there are very little data. Uh, and the whole idea is to do this survey for probably four years or so and analyze the heck out of it and, and see what have we learned. And my hope is at Berkeley, Berkeley's been doing this for a couple of years now, and we're, the whole system is basically using a slight modification of their survey. Um, and, department, and department and search committee chairs are eager to respond because they want to know how to, how to do it right, too. Uh, so it's a big research project that's rolling out right now and should be in place uh, next fall. OK, I know that a number of you have additional questions. This is a very exciting topic. Um, we have a reception now, so I suggest that we continue the conversation over refreshments. And now let's give the speaker and the panel a round of applause.